Hi, everybody. My name is Peggy Gununi. I'm a radiologist at Stanford. Thanks again for the opportunity to come and speak to you guys today. I'm going to be talking about MR guided focus ultrasound applications, specifically in pediatrics. Uh, at Stanford, we use FUS uh, for a number of applications that you'll see pictured here. We, we use it to treat uterine fibroids, bone metastases, uh, and in the brain to treat tremor. But I'm going to be focused on its application in particular to treat soft tissue tumors. And I wanted to uh, introduce a few concepts uh, to you before we get started. There's, there's a concept in radiology specific to pediatrics. It's more general than that, but it, it, it really comes out of pediatrics. It's called the Alara Principle. And it's as low as reasonably achievable. The, the idea is that if you're going to try and image a child to see what's wrong with them, you should try and use the least invasive, lowest dose of radiation possible in order to get the answer. So if the child has a cough, you start off with a chest x-ray rather than a CT scan of the chest, which would have much more radiation. If you're trying to image the tumor in the, in the abdomen, you'll use an ultrasound or an MRI rather than a CT scan. So the idea is to introduce as little risk as possible, do as little damage as possible while you're trying to help the patient. Take that and combine it with a story I'll tell you about uh, a conference I attended. Uh, it was a kind of an unusual mix of people. It was uh, astronomers and MR radiologists. Um, and the, the reason that this group was together is because both uh, people are interested in signal processing. Uh, and the, the astronomers are trying to find, you know, tiny signals coming from subatomic particles uh, to gain information about the first few moments after the Big Bang. Uh, and we're trying to process very small signals coming from the body to generate an image. Uh, and so these two groups were there, and the astronomers spoke first. And after they got up, I got to speak after them. And I have to tell you, it, it was a, a daunting task because I felt like in the last hundred years, they have made such tremendous advances from Einstein's time till now in our understanding of how the universe was formed, what are the components of atoms. And, you know, if you look at what we've done uh, surgically, we, the, the term sawbones still applies. You know, we're using uh, sharper tools. They're made of titanium. Robots control them. But it's really a sharp knife. It's cautery. It's electrocautery, maybe then a hot iron. But it, the same concepts apply. And we're cutting through normal tissue to get to the damaged tissue. And in the process, we're injuring somebody to try to remove something that's bad within them. Ideally, we would minimize that damage. We would really target the area that's abnormal and do as little damage as possible uh, in the process of trying to heal the underlying problem. So I'm, I'm hoping that you'll gain an, an appreciation for how focus ultrasound has that ability, in particular within the pediatric realm. All of our work in PEDS started off actually out of a research grant, and it gets back to what Nir was talking about, about the role of the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, about research in general. The field of sarcoma treatment, sarcomas are malignant soft tissue tumors, in particular in the extremities. Uh, despite advances in surgery, despite advances in radiation, outcomes in the past 20 years really haven't changed much. Uh, and so th there's a need for an improved approach to treating these, these patients. Whether it's uh, new ablative technologies, whether it's combining these with, with chemotherapy and improving the delivery of those agents, it still remains to be determined. But one of the things that we wanted to do was to say, well, if this is ever going to replace standard of care surgery, we need to have the confidence in our MRI that when our MRI tells us that this part of the tumor that I treated, this is in the, the, the leg of a patient, this tumor is growing underneath the skin, the, I treated just the part in red there. In order for us to be able to ever say to the patient, you know what, once we're done with our focus ultrasound treatment, I can guarantee you that the tumor's dead. The only way we can do that is to first treat and then actually have them go on to standard of care resection, take those samples to the pathologist and have the pathologist say, okay, the part that I think is dead is here. Find that part in the tumor and tell me is it dead or not. We need to have that confidence. And so that's what we started off doing is these treat and resect type studies, which are the kind of standard initial approach that we take to these tumor treatments. We treated a handful of patients there, and we gained some confidence in our ability to treat soft tissue tumors. But what we found, actually, is that there was another group of patients that were very, very desirous of what we offered. And kind of going back to what Nir was saying, the patients kind of driving the, the clinicians forward, the same thing happened here. As, as the, my cl clinician colleagues in orthopedics, we, there's a type of tumor called a desmoid tumor. It's not a sarcoma. It's not a malignancy. It's not going to metastasize to other parts of the body. But locally, it's very aggressive. It's very infiltrative. It tends to send its fingers along the different fascial planes between the muscles. It grows around nerves and blood vessels and can cause a lot of uh, dysfunction of limbs. It can uh, cause pain out of proportion to its size. And 
because it is locally very aggressive, it's treated with very aggressive me measures. So it's treated as though it's a sarcoma. It's treated with amputation. It's treated with high dose radiation, which has its own side effects. It's treated with high uh, concentrations of chemotherapy that have their own problems. The surgery, unfortunately, doesn't work very well. Half the time after the surgery, the tumor comes back again. This is despite the, the pathologist looking under the microscope and saying, you've got clean margins. So the, the pathologist says, you did a great job, surgeon. The tumor comes back half the time. It's like they didn't do anything. The, and radiation works in about 70% of patients, not for everybody, it's high dose radiation. But what it does in, in this patient population, many of whom are young, is it introduces a 5% risk that they actually develop an actual cancer afterwards. So we've taken something that's locally very problematic and we've given them a significant risk that sometime in their life they'll develop an actual cancer that will metastasize and cause trouble for them, potentially kill them. You can see what the trouble is. I, I don't know how well this shows up, but there's the tumor in the thigh and it's hard to separate the tumor from the hamstring muscles, from the sciatic nerve, from nearby vessels, from the bone. You can imagine if a surgeon goes in and tries to resect just this tumor, they're gonna to have to somehow peel it off of these nerves or they're gonna damage the nerves in the process of trying to, to do that. It, it, if they're gonna to try to get a margin, they're gonna take muscle. Basically the process of surgery, the recovery from the surgery can be as morbid as the tumor is. So clearly there's an unmet need. My surgeons came to me, my colleagues in orthopedics, and said, can we try to treat these patients with focus ultrasound? We've gotten some experience with sarcoma. How about these guys? We started off with patients who, were, uh, who had gone through all the other options. They'd already had surgery. They'd already had various chemotherapy. This is a patient that I wanted to talk to you about. This young man was 14 when I first treated him. Up until that point, he had had a, a major surgery. This, this tumor first showed up behind his knee. They cut out the tumor, they rebuilt his blood vessels, the tumor came back again, and it came back in a way that caused a fixed flexion. His, his leg was fixed in a bent position. He couldn't use his leg. So they did an above-the-knee amputation. They um, followed that with various medications because despite the amputation, the tumor came back first in his thigh, and then it grew up into his buttock. What you can see is the tumor here, it's traveled along the stump of his sciatic nerve into the buttock area just behind the hip bone. These are, these are MR images from him. And when, when he, was, at this point, his surgeons offered him something called the hemipelvectomy, which is bit, as bad as it sounds, basically. They were gonna cut off part of his, of his pelvis, basically, and his remaining thigh to try and get rid of this tumor. So uh, that, this was the patient that, one of the first patients that my colleagues came to me and said, can we treat? We treated him with focus ultrasound. We ablated the tumor here. There was a little bit of a recurrence. We brought him back and treated him again. And since then, the tumor has basically been gone. There's a little bit of schmutz there. It's not really tumor. It's not growing. We've been able to just follow him. I'll show you a picture of him later. But this really shows the potential of, of the, what this modality can do uh, in terms of the, the alteration it's had in this patient's life. Another application that we've applied in pediatrics is to vascular malformations. These are very common tumors. Uh, people are born with them. Uh, you know, those of us that have had kids, stork bites, angel marks. Uh, these are very, you know, hemangiomas. These are things that we all see. The little birthmarks, those tend to go away. They're of no consequence. And other times, there are, uh, there are versions of these vascular malformations that grow. They tend to grow sometimes during, during puberty when various hormones are, uh, are uh, increasing, they can increase during pregnancy as well, and they cause a lot of pain, pain out of proportion to their size. Um, the standard of care used to be surgery, which is what happened in this young man. He was 17 when I first saw him. He'd been treated with surgery. The surgeon tried to resect this. His pain before the surgery was seven. After the surgery, it was eight because basically the surgeon missed part of it. I have the advantage on MR of being able to see exactly where the lesion is, but these aren't very palpable for the surgeon. They have to use anatomic landmarks to try and cut it out. He missed a little bit. So the tumor came back, the pain came back. We treated him with focus ultrasound. There was the area of, of the remnant tissue. We treated him and ablated him. Uh, here he was a few months later, his pain was completely gone. He went from somebody who couldn't work in a retail job because standing all day uh, at the gap was more than he could handle. That summer he got a construction job. So he was able to really work and put a lot of weight on his leg and the pain's been completely gone since then. A again, minimize the damage done as opposed to what the surgeon had done, cutting through normal muscle to get to this, cutting out some normal muscle to try and get a margin around this. We were able to just target the area, ablate the tumor, send him home the same day, quick recovery, uh, and uh, get on with his life uh, w without all the, the morbidity associated with other types of treatments. Surgery is one option for these patients. Another uh, approach is ultrasound-guided sclerotherapy. They use ultrasound to inject alcohol 
there's a tendency for the tumor to recur after that, and not all of these tumors are visible under, under ultrasound. So with MR, I can easily see the tumor, and our hope is by completely destroying the tumor, hopefully there's no recurrence. We're still trying to investigate that, but th that's another potential application in pediatrics that we're very excited about. And I should say both with desmoids and now increasingly with vascular malformations, with a subset of vascular malformations, at least at our institution, focus ultrasound has moved into the front line of therapy, certainly with desmoids. Our surgeons don't operate on desmoid tumors anymore. It's certainly not without first saying, is, it, is there anything you can do? And even when I say, I don't think so, they say, are you sure? Because they really don't want to operate on these patients anymore. Another area of pediatrics is in osteoidosteomas. This is pioneering work that came out of Rome and La Sapienza, a colleague, Alessandro Napoli, first demonstrated this. As many of you are aware, we use focus ultrasound in the United States. It's clinically approved. It's approved by insurance companies to treat bone metastases. What Alessandro wondered, is it possible to use this to treat osteoidosteomas as well? And they, they pioneered this work showing that actually you can use this as a way to treat these patients and, uh, and minimize, again, the injury that, that these cause. These are younger patients. They tend to have, it's this little tiny little nidus, and it causes a lot of local inflammation. Here's an MRI from the same patient. This tiny little thing is resulting in a tremendous amount of edema in the bone. Uh, it's, and he, he basically, he was, it was gotten to the point where he couldn't participate in his physical activities at school. And the pain associated with these things is very characteristic. It tends to occur at night. And so he, he was waking up. He wasn't able to sleep normally. It was in, interfering with his life and with his school. Uh, I'll read you the, the, um, the, the note that the orthopedic surgeon sent uh, after we treated this patient. He said, this patient was a candidate for either open sur surgical curatage, arthroscopy of the hip, or radiofrequency ablation. Radiofrequency is really one of the standards right now. But what they have to do is they have to drill, through, they have to insert a probe through the skin, through the muscle, and through the bone to get into this region and then ablate the tumor with, uh, with electrical energy, basically. What we were able to do is aim the energy through the hip area here, moving this out of the way just by repositioning the patient, and in a few sonications, destroy the tumor and relieve his pain. It, just to continue with what he said, all of these approaches are high risk in the hip joint in a young individual. They can da damage the cartilage and the labrum and lead to long-term irreversible consequences, consequences, which are too much morbidity for this condition. Medical management was not sufficient. He was not tolerating his anti-inflammatories. While high-frequency ultrasound, this goes back to what, an interesting thing, all of the people don't know what this technology is. They call it high-density frequency ultrasound. It just goes, you know, there's an educational process that needs to happen. And this is in a, somebody who is a believer. Uh, while high-density frequency ultrasound is a new treatment for this condition, and it is very much on its way to becoming the standard of care as it becomes more available and better studied, we're fortunate enough here at Stanford to have this available to us. So I'm, I'm fortunate to work with colleagues like that who see these results in their patients and then have no problem sending them, more of them my way. But it's, it's critical to be able to demonstrate these results in, in, in prospective studies, and uh, we'll talk about some of that in a minute as well. I wanted to conclude with a few clinical stories. This is an example of a young man. He was, again, 15, I think, when I first saw him. He had a, a desmoid tumor in the palm of his hand. It wrapped around the ulnar tendons and the, the muscles there and the ulnar nerve there. They were offering him a year of chemotherapy at some of the major, uh, they'd gone to every um, major cancer center in the country, and they were offering him a year of chemotherapy to treat this. We treated it with focus ultrasound, it's gone. You know, he avoided all the chemotherapy, avoided all the damage that could have happened from that and, and the negative consequences. This is a, a four-year-old that I treated. She, was, uh, she has a, a desmoid tumor in her forearm. Uh, she had gone to, again, a major sister, sister institution that was a major pediatric hospital. They'd given her a year of chemo. Every uh, week, the parents would drive from their state to that other state and get chemotherapy and then recover from the chemo and then come back and do this again. It didn't work. They tried her another drug called serafinib. She had an allergic reaction to it that put her in the ICU. I had gone to this institution and talked about our experience, so they, they knew about it. They, they referred the patient to me. Um, and we treated her. Here's a, a slice, an MRI slice of her forearm. Here's the tumor here. As you can see, it's right next to the skin. It's right next to the tendons in the forearm. The radial nerve is right there. We have no space, essentially. And our, our goal isn't to eradicate this tumor. You can go, imagine if a surgeon goes in and tries to cut this out, they're going to damage a lot of stuff trying to get this tumor out, and half the time it's going to come back again. So our goal is to try and minimize that damage and kill as much of this tumor as possible. This whole distance, by the way, is five centimeters. You know, she's a four-year-old girl. It's a tiny little arm that we're treating here. 
This picture makes it seem big. Here it is immediately afterwards. The tumor is essentially dead. The tumor, the, the tumor volume is cut in half on an MRI three months later. The important thing is that the next day I went, went to see her in the hospital. She's playing with her toys as though nothing had happened. Uh, and you know, here she is a few days later on, in her gymnastics class or making snow angels. It's, it's again like nothing had, been, had happened to her. Uh, we really caused no damage and were able to kill a significant chunk of this tumor. Here's a picture of that young man that I told you about that was offered a hemipelvectomy. Uh, he races bicycles, actually, is one of his hobbies. He races BMX bicycles. This is a national competition that he competed in. With one leg uh, and a prosthesis on the stump on the other side, he finished 49th out of 52 people. So pretty amazing, actually, uh, considering that when we met him, he was being offered a hemipelvectomy. So th this picture, I think, really summarizes uh, the, the opportunities that MR guided focus ultrasound provides. I, I wanted to, to, to conclude with one final thing that you know, Neil talked about the growth in this uh, technology and you know, growing up to 50,000 patients and so forth. But, um, and, and at Stanford, I've gone from doing a few years ago doing one of these procedures a month to one a week to now we're doing two or three procedures uh, a week now, which is a tremendous growth. Um, but in order to get there, we still represent the early adopters. We're still the innovators, the people that are trying to push things. It hasn't gotten to the point yet, of, at least in the US, uh, of, of becoming mainstream or even early mainstream yet. And it, it, part of the challenges are in raising funds for some of the research proposals that Nir talked about, some of the proposals that I'm talking about here. And honestly, without the, the Fuss Foundation, we wouldn't be there. We wouldn't be able to get there. We, we still need that support to get over the hump to really get to the point where, you know, neurosurgery considers the standard of care, where orthopedic surgery considers the standard of care, where oncology considers the standard of care. We're not there yet, but we need to get beyond folks like us that are the, the, the early folks and get to the more mainstream. We can't do it without the Fuss Foundation. Thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to you.